In this week's video, we'll examine the question, is the bull market topping out? To view the video in full screen mode, use this icon in the lower right hand corner of your video player. To improve the clarity of the charts, use this icon in the lower right hand corner of your video player. We're on the road this week, so please bear with us if the cursor and or the audio is a little off. Next week, we'll be back in Atlanta for Friday's video. A few points here from a bullish perspective. 2011 correction, bottom, and rally. 2015 is its own year, but we can learn something about a bottoming process by studying the past. Lower highs. We can make an argument that we have one, two, three, four, five of them before the rally really resumed off the bottom. Or you can even make an argument that we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine of them from the peak. That's somewhat of the good news. The bad news is the window is starting to close both from a data perspective and a comparison perspective when you look at a similar rally off of a low. This is 91 calendar days from the October retest low in 2011 to the point where the rally really resumed and the chart started to improve. If we go 91 days from a similar low in 2015, which was September 29th, that takes us to December 29th of 2015. Meaning, the ugly chart pattern that we have in 2015 and the fact that it's taken so long to try to improve really isn't that much different from what we've seen in 2011. That's the good news. The bad news is the bulls need to get their act together soon. They're becoming more and more vulnerable, as we'll see in the charts. The first set of charts that we're going to examine will give us some visuals as to why we were able to take no action a week ago and we had to take some defensive action today. As clients know, maybe regular viewers as well, when we get these sideways markets, the model goes into various forms of a whipsaw mode to try to reduce trading frequency. When we're under the guide of the whipsaw rules, that does not mean that we can ignore deteriorating facts and the model. It basically says that our tolerances get wider. We want the market to prove more to us before we make an adjustment. And that prove it to us can be in a bullish manner or in a bearish manner. Weekly moving averages, nothing particularly magical about them. The model uses numerous inputs. The fastest moving average here makes a lower high in 2007 and it shifts from a full bore bullish look to a full bore bearish look late in 2008. These are the exact same moving averages a week ago. Today is December 18th, Friday. This is December 11th on a Friday. In this case, the model is only asking questions about whether or not the fastest moving average is above or below. It doesn't have anything to do with the slopes. So this gives you some type of visual when we say the math is getting more vulnerable. We get this turn down here and we can see mathematically that if the market doesn't right itself soon, we might get crossovers. So when we're here, Every question about blue being above or below, they're all yes. If we fast forward a week, you can see now instead of getting all yeses, we have some no's here. So in this case, you can see some of the deterioration that took place over the last week. It hasn't deteriorated everywhere in the model, but some of the answers are now changing from bullish to bearish or in the model's case, yes to no. And even though we're under the guide of whipsaw rules, we can't ignore the evidence. At some point, the rules require us to make some adjustments, which was the case this week. Same concepts here. Now we're just using some daily moving averages. You can see 
During the bear market in 2008, we have a full bore bearish look with the fastest moving average blue on the bottom and the slopes are all down. Here, when the stock market bottoms in the spring of 2009, here eventually we migrate to or morph into a full bore bullish look where instead of blue being on the bottom, the fastest moving average blue is on the top and all of the slopes are up. Here's a look of the exact same moving averages a week ago on December 11th to give you some idea of what we're talking about, about vulnerable math. The math here is not that vulnerable. As we start to roll over here, we know mathematically that if the market doesn't right itself, eventually we're going to get bearish moving average crossovers and yes answers are going to morph into no answers. So a week ago, if the only question that we were asking here was, is blue above, which is the case here, the answer was yes in all instances. If we fast forward a week, the answers are still yes. So in terms of the model from a binary perspective, not much has changed here. But from a mental preparation perspective, this is the look a week ago now we have a discernible lower high in the moving averages. The white space in here is starting to narrow and our slopes are getting steeper. That doesn't mean that any of the answers to the binary questions have changed, but what it's telling us is if the market doesn't right itself relatively soon, we are going to get numerous binary yeses that are going to flip over fairly rapidly from here to binary no's, which means next Friday, if we have another ugly week, the cut that we have to the growth side could be very significant relative to the fairly tame cut that we made today on Friday, December 18th. In addition to the CCM market model, we also have an ETF scoring system that tells us what to plug into both sides of the equation, the growth side and the conservative side. The market model, the master market model, helps us with that split between the two. When we are reviewing the ETF scoring model charts in the present day, we are getting a mixed look. We have not converted over to a maximum fear look yet. This is tech stocks, the triple Qs in the ETF world, relative to bonds or intermediate term treasuries with the ticker symbol IEF. Think of this somewhat as a risk on risk off ratio. When you're confident about the future, you would prefer to own growth oriented tech stocks over more defensive and conservative bonds. Conversely, when you're concerned or you want to be defensive, the ratio falls as it did starting in October of 2007 into calendar year 2008. Here, purpose of the exercise, here is where the stock market peaked in October of 2007. And you can see the ratio switches from a bullish slope to a bearish slope almost immediately and starts making lower highs and lower lows. In 2015, the S&P 500 peaked seven months ago. So this is the look of this ratio seven months after the S&P 500 peaked. We have a discernible lower high here and we've already made several weekly lower lows here. How does the exact same ratio look today seven months after the stock market peaked? If you follow along on Twitter, you may already know the answer. The answer is much better. The stock market peaked in 2015 in May. This is the same ratio here. Seven months after the peak, a lower high, several weekly lower lows. Seven months after the stock market peaked in 2015, this ratio looks much better. Does this tell us that there's no possible way that we're morphing into a bear market in 2015? Absolutely, positively, no. It doesn't tell us anything like that. But it does tell us that the market's tolerance for risk seven months after the stock market peaked in 2015 is quite a bit better than the stock market's tolerance for risk seven months after the peak in October of 2007. 
You may argue this is one bear market. What about other bear markets? So in this example, let's go back to the dot-com bust. In this case, concepts are the same here. We're still doing risk on tech stocks relative to more defensive-oriented consumer staples. And think of it this way. If I'm running a mutual fund and my mandate is to be 100% invested in stocks, I can't go to cash, I can't buy bonds, I can't short, and that's the case for many growth mutual funds, then when I want to get defensive, I can move into, in many cases, defensive consumer staples to try to lessen the severity of the blow. And you can see here in 2000, those of you that were in the markets, remember that we peaked in March of 2000 here. This is where the S&P 500 peaked, and this is the S&P 500 on the bottom here. This is the ratio here. The stock market peaks. The ratio peaks almost in unison. Seven months after the stock market peaked, you can see the ratio has a steep bearish and risk-off slope and has made lower a lower low, a lower high, a lower low, and several weekly lower lows. We're downtrending here for several months, seven months from the peak. How does the exact same ratio look today? The answer is much better. This is seven months after the stock market peaked in the year 2000. This is seven months after the S&P 500 peaked in 2015. We don't have any lower lows here. In fact, we just made a new higher high on the ratio recently. We don't have a lower low yet. This is representative of many instances that we will see when we're looking through charts related to the ETF scoring system. doesn't tell us that this chart can't morph into something like this. doesn't tell us that at all. It just tells us that right now, based on the evidence that we have in hand, the market's tolerance for risk is better seven months after the peak in 2015, quite a bit better than it was seven months after the peak in the year 2000. We have a similar situation when we look at the financial crisis bear market. This is seven months after the peak, same ratio tech stocks relative to more defensive consumer staples, clearly in a downtrend, several weekly lower lows here. This is several months and a discernible lower high seven months after the S&P 500 peaks in October of 2007. Just comparing head to head again, seven months after the peak, present day 2015, seven months after the peak. You can say these are two examples, and that's a very small sample size, and that would be true. The market model, however, is based on common sense and economic principles. Common sense and economics 101 tells us that in most bear markets, it's reasonable to anticipate that this ratio will look similar. In most instances, we would expect managers to prefer consumer staple stocks that are more stable and less risky in a bear market over growth-oriented tech stocks, many of which that do not pay dividends, especially early in their life cycle. The same can be said for tech stocks relative to intermediate-term treasuries. Even though we only looked at two examples, the ratio is based on clear economic principles and the simple principle of supply and demand. The concepts here are similar to the ratio charts that we just looked at. S&P 500, 2007, 2008, the blue line here is the 100 week moving average. Notice the slope is up and bullish here in 2007. Price drops below it, the slope starts to flatten out. This is indecisive. When we come back up to try to recapture the 100-week moving average, we are rejected and price falls. This is 2008. This is the bear market. How does the exact same chart look in 2015? It looks better from a trend perspective. Look at the slope of the blue line here. Eventually it rolls over, but it's flat here. 
is still relatively steep and bullish in 2015. Also here, price rejected. Here we went below it and we recaptured the 100 day with a very, very nice weekly candlestick. The concerns would be the lower high. That's a legitimate concern, not a showstopper, but it's real. This is observable and it's a fact. And that we're retesting that level again. So this chart, like many others, will give us some good information going forward. It may be bearish data. It may be bullish. No predictions necessary. We'll monitor and adjust. Why are allocations mixed right now? Because the evidence is mixed. Markets are not binary. They're not 100% bullish or 100% bearish. And that speaks to risk versus reward. If we understand extremes like the look of this max fear chart in 2008 and the look of this new bull market chart in 2009, it helps us understand everything in between. So using these weekly charts and these faster moving averages, here's a clear example of observable evidence that's deteriorating. However, remember, we showed last week that this chart in 2015 doesn't look that much different than the rally off the 2011 low. We had a 61.8% retracement. That's when it looks similar. And then the rally resumed. That doesn't discount, though, that this is observable evidence that's deteriorating. It's just not necessarily a showstopper, but it definitely is checking no or bearish boxes now. And that's one of the reasons why our allocations to growth have been reduced. Risks are unquestionably increasing. Keeping things consistent, these are our longer duration moving averages, and these are for illustrative purposes only. By no means are these moving averages the CCM market model. The model uses similar moving averages, and we use these charts to illustrate concepts. Full bore bearish look, full bore bullish look. These are the same moving averages as of the close on Friday, December 18th. We've zoomed in this week so you can see some of the deterioration. First, we have a tight look, and we know that we can get big moves out of tight looks. It's a mixed bag. Our slopes were up here. Now they've rolled over. Those are binary questions. They're observable. The model can track them. However, blue is still on the top. Full bore bullish look is when blue the fastest is on the top. Full bore bearish would be when we get all of our moving average crossovers and we would get a look like this. So this illustrates the mixed bag look. Part of our evidence is bearish and part of our evidence is still bullish. This is a more concerning look here in 2015, but remember during the give back move in 2011, here's the low. This is the 61.8% retracement. If we're looking at a daily chart, we also had deteriorating look. The slopes of our moving averages are up here in 2011 and they roll over. Also note, the trends are actually stronger in 2015 than they were at a similar point in 2011. How do we know that? Well, in this case, the fastest moving average is still on top in the present day, and here it's on the bottom. Purpose of showing this is this look here and this look here are concerning, but they're not necessarily a showstopper because this look here morphed into this sharp rally. This point here is this point here, concerning evidence. The point of showing this is ugly looking charts can improve at any time, which is why maximum flexibility is so important. Conversely, good looking charts can start to deteriorate at any time. As humans, our natural tendency, and that would include yours truly, would be to extrapolate this bearish look. We're going to continue to fall. Ugly looking charts can improve at any time. Not a forecast, just a fact about the way markets work.
quickly go through support and some other mixed bag charts. This is the NASDAQ. This is the chart we covered a week ago. This is December 11th. Support, support, support. Reason to be patient. Fast forward. And we still have reason to hope. We're still near this cluster of possible support. However, the evidence has deteriorated here, meaning the risks have increased. And it's one of the reasons why we reduced risk incrementally on Friday, December 18th. Last week, we held this line. Twice this week, we've gone below it intraday. On Monday, we closed below this line on Friday. That's the glass half empty. The try to be patient with our growth-oriented investments is resistance, resistance, support. We haven't broken the parallel line here yet. We'll keep an open mind about what happens here, but this chart is very, very similar to the ones that we're going to show with the Dow and the S&P 500. This is the Dow a week ago on Friday, December 11th. Reasons to be patient. Fast forward to look at the same chart on Friday, December 18th. A week later, we broke this trend line, which was not the case a week ago. Very, very similar comments here that we made with the NASDAQ reasons to be concerned mixed with rational reasons for hope. S&P 500 a week ago, December 11th, possible support. We said even if this breaks, we'd like to see what happens here near these pink lines. The same chart as of Friday, December 18th, a week later, while we did hold this line here some bad things did happen intra week we went below it didn't do that here this is a sign of weakness another concern here would be when we were at the lower end of the channel here we made it to the upper end of the channel here so far we have not a little bit of a sign of weakness here a sign of weakness here we still have reasons to be patient reasons to be patient in terms of possible support. I could show you numerous charts this week that paint a very, very similar picture. There are reasons to be concerned, balanced with reasons still to be hopeful, which speaks to risk versus reward. This chart and many others are telling us to keep an open mind about all outcomes. The bear market scenario is alive and well. However, the window for the bulls has not closed yet. It's getting more narrow, and they need to take a stand relatively soon, but that could happen next week or the week after. This chart would fall under the reason for hope and reason for some patience and reason for holding on to some growth assets. These are the pivots weekly. You can see here we congregated around them, even dropped below the two pivot lines here, and then rallied. This week, we are now congregating around the same weekly pivots that might act as potential support. Everything that we just said about the weekly chart applies to the monthly chart. Here are the pivots. And that tells us that we have the same information on multiple time frames. These charts are going to give us some good information. It will either be bearish or bullish. Right now, like the market itself... These charts aren't giving us a strong signal either way. They're indecisive. We're literally right in between the two monthly pivots on December 18th. Another chart where we'll get some good information. We're either going to hold at these areas of potential support, 1994, 1995. Here, resistance, resistance, support, coming back down. This is an angle here on the daily chart. You can't see it. The line covers it. They all come in in this area here. Good information. It may be bullish. It may be bearish. Right now it's saying try to be patient with some, not all, of your growth capital. The previous statements apply to our approach and our model. Your needs and goals may vary. Risk on versus risk off. Support for stocks. Support for stocks. Support for stocks. We're back in the same General area, this is another chart telling us to keep an open mind about a possible bounce in risk. And we also learn something if this ratio 
moves down into this area here. If we get into this area here, bear market odds start to increase. That hasn't happened yet. We'll keep an open mind about this chart and all the other charts. Checking in on our A to B fibs bullish trend. We're still in normal give back territory. If price can hold the 61.8% retracement, then the bullish case gains some steam. If we move into this area here, it starts to discount this rally off the low from a probability perspective. All of these charts reinforce the concept that the hard data, the market model, and the rules will guide us if we're willing to listen with a flexible, unbiased, and open mind. How do we track all of this and convert it into a usable and actionable format in a reasonable amount of time? The sub-models, we answer binary questions, some of them manually done, some of them programmed in Excel, and we also enter in unbiased and hard data. The sub-models allow us to get a handle on the market's current profile, and the master CCM market model then looks at the current profile, compares it to past profiles, and recommends a prudent allocation between risk assets such as stocks and conservative assets such as bonds. Conservative assets can consist of cash, bonds, currencies, or any number of investment options. If you'd like to learn more about the market model or our money management services, you can visit our website, follow along on Twitter, Facebook, read our blog short takes, or watch past videos on the Shivako Capital channel on YouTube. The material in this video has no regard to the specific investment objectives, financial situation, or particular needs of any viewer. This video is presented solely for informational purposes and is not to be construed as a solicitation or offer to buy or sell any security or any related financial instruments, nor should any of the content be taken as investment advice. Any opinions expressed in this video are subject to change without notice, and Shivako Capital Management, LLC, or CCM, is not under any obligation to update or keep current the information contained herein. CCM and its respective officers and associates or clients may have an interest in the securities or derivatives of any entities referred to in this material. CCM accepts no liability whatsoever for any loss or damage of any kind arising out of the use of all or any part of this material. We recommend that you consult with a licensed and qualified professional before making any investment decision.